direction of Deputy Commissioner Adam Herbst, the Office of Aging and Long-Term Care is charged with developing and implementing policies to meet the needs of older New Yorkers and people with disabilities who require long-term care. As you may not know, the office's work encompasses everything, pre-hospital and then post-acute or from a hospital care for the, each person's well-being, right? So you're thinking of living in the community and going into the um, nursing home, right? So it's everything in, on the outside where you're not in the hospital, basically, or in an ambulance. Everything is under the Office of Aging and Long-Term Care. What does it look like? <laughs> I'm gonna apologize in advance. You're gonna hear me use a, probably a lot of acronyms because healthcare loves acronyms, as you all know. Um, so I'm trying very hard to break out of that. But <laughs> that said, you're gonna see them here <laughs> and I'm gonna try to explain them to the extent I can. Um, so what you see is, this is government, <laughs> right? So we have an organization. Um, it's a very important organization, but I'm, I'm kind of going to vary off my script a little bit. Don't tell Adam, okay? Um, but it's easier for me to do it this way. So we have Adam and Valerie who sit at the top. From there, you see they've got five centers under them. They've also got a data group and a special advisor. Okay, so going across, um, starting over here with the Center for Aging. I'm going to try my pointer that Hannah showed me. <laughs> Center for Aging and Long-Term Care Finances and Supports. Effectively, Andrew's group does everything, right? They're interacting with the Medicaid program. They're interacting with um, the governor's office. They're focusing on Alzheimer's disease and initiatives related to that. They're also focusing on the nursing home transition diversion and traumatic brain injury waiver uh, programs that have been long established in the health department and very successful that's all under them. So when you see that there's only one, two, three, four, five boxes under them, that's really an understatement. <laughs> all right, and then moving over to licensure, planning, and finance. None of these are, are very easy to roll off the tongue, so bear with me. But licensure, planning, and finance, that's basically the life of a provider and the life of a facility, right? They're issuing a license or they're taking one away, <laughs> which we hope doesn't happen, but um, they're closing facilities too. So when a facility or a provider determines it's ready to close, then we have to go through a process and that's the last stop. They'll actually close the books down. Um, and under that, you see they've got a number of different initiatives. Um, and of course, they're related over here. Ooh, my pointer, Heidi. Center for Planning, Life Insurance, and Finance, where they're this was under our former office, but this is our, our nursing home licensure team. So all licensure of nursing homes, adult care facilities, and home care and hospice providers in New York State falls under this center. I'm gonna skip over myself real quick. Um, I'm gonna go, because I can't see that well. <laughs> We're gonna go to long-term care regulatory and policy initiatives again incredibly important, a lot of moving parts. That's where the master plan resides. Um, so they are very, very busy people. Um, they're pulling together a lot of different initiatives, all of the stakeholder work groups, all of the, the cross-agency communication happens there. They're also working to develop new initiatives and things that come out of the master plan. They're coming back to us and saying, hey, can we do this? Well, what do we need to do that? Of course, it's also important to have um, an administrative and budget group. Um, they keep us, keep us honest. Uh, they tell me all the time um, when I say I want more staff, they say, you can't, you're at Target. And I say, well, but I need those staff. And they're like, but we're at Target. So the more I whine, the more they just say we're at Target. And I say, okay, that means I can't have staff right now. What do I need to do to get it? So <laughs> that's what their role is. So they're, they're managing the money and telling us where I don't have any. <laughs> we also have data. Data is like super important. And what our data team has done, 
the health department is wrought with data. We have all kinds of data on all kinds of different things. But actually consolidating it and understanding it is something totally different. That's what Brett's team does. Brett's team is really pulling all that together and saying, okay, we know that you have 36 reports all related to bed census. Uh, maybe there's a better way to do that and a better way to display it. So a lot of those displays that you see on our health department's website, Brett's team has been informing, and that's the, that's the culmination of months of work for them to actually pull together that information and make it logical. <laughs> because sometimes you look at numbers, and, and I look at them sometimes, and I'm like, what? <laughs> but they make it sensible. So that's, I'm very grateful for them. Now I'm gonna turn it over to my little center here in the middle, and I say my little center, I have 200 staff statewide. Um, I have a central office. I oversee three program areas. I oversee um, surveillance of nursing homes and uh, intermediate care facilities for IID. <laughs> Um, and that's under an, an arrangement uh, the Department of Health has with the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities that allows us to survey those community residences. I also oversee adult care facilities and assisted living programs, hospice and home care. So all of the, the actual life of our provider, right? So the provider is alive, it's licensed, and it's operating we survey them. We're looking for regulatory compliance. We're looking for, uh, in some cases, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services involvement. Um, but anything that happens in these other centers comes into my center. And we start to see the, how those policies that were suggested, how the real-time application of those policies is taking effect we can actually inform back and say, it's not working, or you need to tweak it, because we see it real time. We know what's happening. And um, where we have involvement where, with the nursing home uh, transition and diversion waiver, we're seeing what's happening out there with that individual. So we can feed that information back and say, this isn't working for that person, you need to modify their waiver, you need to, we need to work together to come up with a better support for them. So that's, that's what my center does. You see here, we, we really work to break down the silos. And you'll hear us say that a lot, that we have silos. We, they were, I've been with the health department for a good long time. We've got silos. <laughs> but Adam and Val have really worked very hard to break them. And through this, usually when I do my presentation, it, it's, um, I have like a lot of crosses and stuff. Val did this one, she made it a lot more simple. But we all interact with each other all the time. There'd be a lot of X's and crosses if I did it, but I feed information to all of those other program areas. That said, here's what my center actually looks like. Um, it's kind of, it, we broke it down a little bit. I've got my adult care facilities and assisted living surveillance. And I'm, up there I've got my data team because I won't let Brett go. Um, I need that data. <laughs> home and community-based services, which is hospice and home care surveillance, nursing home surveillance, and of course I've got operations because I still have a lot of other stuff that I do too, not just surveillance, right? I'm also surveillance and operations. So you see I've got professional credentialing. We license nursing home administrators. We uh, approve home care training programs. We also do the certified nurse aid registry. So we have a lot of stuff happening in my little center. And that team is amazing. They're rocking and rolling. They've been pretty busy, but they really were having a good time. And I'm going to say a little bit more about my center, but um, just in the wake of the public health emergency, we've really observed the unprecedented workforce issues that you all face. And so do we. Um, the turnover and the need to have education and support. Um, the turnover itself, because we lost a ton of institutional knowledge at the state and in the providers. It, it's just unprecedented. 
We're hearing from nursing homes who, all the time saying, um, you know, they're starting to have struggles. And we're like, well, how's that possible? You've been doing so well. We lost all of our key staff. So they're working now to try to rebuild. And in the rebuilding process, there's turnover in that. So it's just, it's never ending. And uh, so we said we need to do some education and support. So one of our first initiatives is to pull together some opportunities for providers and for our own staff to learn, to learn more about the long-term services and supports available in New York State, how they can be effectuated here under the Office of Aging and Long-Term Care, and how we can retain people, how we can really find some benefits, find, some, find a way to make it happen and, and rebuild what we needed. Following a number of policy changes that were effectuated by the Hochul administration, we've been successful in onboarding many new team members. I say there's 200 staff. There wasn't that many about six months ago. Uh, we have been on a hiring frenzy, and we're competing with some of you, and you're competing with us because we lose people to you sometimes, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> um, I know it doesn't feel that way, and sometimes we take two steps forward and three steps back. But that's, I think, the way that things are going to be over the next couple of years as we start to repair. I'm hopeful that the last two or three years are in our rear view. There has never, I hope we never have to go through what we went through again. Um, I hope we learn from it and I hope that we grow from it as well. And I think that we're doing that. And I think this investment in the Office of Aging and Long-Term Care is a commitment. I think that you're going to see changes. And I think they're starting now. It seems very slow. Um, that's government, folks. <laughs> but I think it's going to grow. And I think once things start to happen, it's going to happen quickly. We've still got a fairly significant hill to climb. OK, it's probably not Mount Marcy anymore. It might be closer to Whiteface. <laughs> but not insurmountable, not something I want to do by myself. <laughs> Surveillance is directly impacted by state and federal policy changes, and the feds change their policies regularly, so we're kind of always trying to stay on the up and up, and I know you are too. We have a great team. We have great leaders in Val and Adam. We're super committed. We all have the same goal. You and we have the same goal. We want to see New Yorkers age with dignity and respect in the setting that's most appropriate to what their needs are and what their expressed desires are. We can do it. We will do it. We will do it together, OK? We need, your, we need stakeholder support. We need you to give us ideas. We need you to, to tell us, Heidi, that's not working. The way that you're doing this, that's not working. I heard somebody earlier today talking about um, the wages and how that's impacting your ability to attract talent. I hear you. How can we make it better? What can we do? I'm going to talk a little bit today about some of the initiatives that we have forthcoming. Again, it takes time. Sometimes we feel like we don't have time, but we have to work together. And I'm committed. Adam and Val are committed. We will work with you. We want to hear your ideas. Nothing's off the table. Um, any, the more innovative you can be, the better we will be in the, in the long run, right? And we all have a vested interest in the long-term care continuum. I know I want it to be stellar <laughs> when I'm there. So I really want to make sure that we build up what we need for the future. I really feel like the Adirondacks is the place to make it happen. Um, not only is there just unparalleled beauty but this can be a destination for great long-term care. We just need to figure out how to work out the bugs. And I don't, I'm not just talking about black fly season. I'm talking about how do we figure out how to attract talent up here in the North Country? How do we figure out how to maybe pull people down from some of those urban centers, urban centers, right, air quotes? How do we get them here? How do we get them into our communities here? What can we do together to influence that. Let's look into it a little bit more today and then give it some thought. Again, we're open. 
All right, Heidi, I, you said enough, I know. <laughs> Let's talk about workforce investment. I think you can hear from my tone and everything that I'm telling you, I understand the impacts here in the North Country. Probably not as boots on the ground as all of you, but definitely I hear them, I understand them, I hear them in my own community, so I totally respect it. We've made some advancements, not enough, not by any stretch, but we're working to make some changes. And these are the list of changes that are on our agenda. The state fiscal year 24 budget, which is the budget cycle that we're currently in, the state budget, adds to previous supports for the healthcare workforce, okay? There's also cost of living adjustments for workers in certain fields that have direct caregiver qualifications. We're also going to provide tuition assistance in achieving a bachelor's degree in nursing so that we can improve the volume of nurses here in New York State. And there's a new initiative targeting direct care workers to solicit for training centers in each of the economic development regions as well as a stackable credential curriculum that will help to train individuals who wish to have personal care aid, home health aid, and certified nurse aid certification. So we're building that up, right? Because, and I heard somebody say it earlier today, and I wanna give credit, I think it was you, you said, there's more to it than just getting my home health aid license or my home health aid cert certification, right? There's more to it. Well, there is more to it. And we understand that, and we wanna give you a path, right? You don't have to just stop at being a home health aide. You, there's a whole world that's open to you once you cross through that, that window. Let's make it happen. There is also a new initiative that bears the title of relieving the burden of healthcare workers. It's only in its design phase. I can't say more about it, but it's coming, okay? So there is, acknowledgement that there is a need and it's here in the north country for sure it's statewide a hundred percent but let's figure out how together how we can get some of that up here in the north country right all right so let's talk a little bit about the master plan governor hochul signed executive order number 23 in november of last year that directed the New York State Master Plan for Aging to coordinate existing and new state policy and programs and created a blueprint of strategies to be implemented to ensure that older New Yorkers can live fulfilling lives in good health, with freedom, dignity, and independence for as long as possible. You heard Adam say it earlier, you're probably gonna hear me say it a couple of more times, that's our mission. And that mission, our mission in Office of Aging and Long-Term Care coincides with the mission of the Hochul administration as it relates to this master plan. Why do we need a master plan, right? We hear that question a lot, like, is this just another government suggestion and nothing's gonna come of it? It seems so nebulous. We have a growing population with increase in unprecedented longevity. People live longer. <laughs> Up here in the North Country, I'm, it's gotta be the air, right? People live longer. It's heterogeneous. We have a lot of payer sources. We, we have a lot of functional ability discrepancies, right? Or disparities, I guess that's a better word. Um, it's culturally diverse. We have a, about 41% of older adults here in New York State, were born outside the United States. And it's socially and economically impactful. Older adults are remaining integrated in our social and environment, um, in our communities, and in our economic lives for longer, right? The retirement age has been extended, much to the chagrin of people like myself. Um, <laughs> People are around longer. People aren't retiring and snow burning down to Florida anymore. They're staying here, they're in our communities, they're part of our lives. But the current systems, and I can speak to this specifically from my family's perspective, the systems are hard. They're hard to navigate. 
you really got to have some type of intuitive knowledge or somebody on the inside to tell you how to navigate this stuff. The benefits are sometimes unclear. There's poor prevention. Uh, we're looking more, um, it's more reactive than proactive. And it's siloed. I'm using that term again. It's a siloed approach. Um, we're dealing with the ambulance. We're dealing with the hospital. We're dealing with the nursing home. We're dealing with the adult care facility. No. We have to break that down. We've got to figure it out together. You heard Adam mention that we have our state agency partners, and, and Greg will be on later today from the uh, State Office for the Aging. But you see it's pretty vast. Um, these all make up the state agency council. So you see we've got some ones in there that you may not even think about. Uh, Department of Transportation, Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Services. We call them dishes. Um, again, these are, these are all involved in the Master Plan for Aging. And the council is the body that contributes subject matter expertise and helps with data needs to support the subcommittees in the work groups that are associated with the master plan. So I brought up the subcommittee, so now I got to talk about them a little bit. There's eight of them. They began meeting in April to take on the work of addressing the challenges that are going to feed these new policies that the master plan will be developing. Long-term services and supports uh, will be considered across the continuum from non-medical home and community-based services to residential facilities like nursing homes and adult care facilities. They're not focused on how it's paid. That's really critical. That's a critical key fact. They're not focusing on how they're paid, but the variety that are available. So they're actually looking at the services and supports and what's available. Again, not the payer, not the payer source. Home and community-based services is focused on um, issues about access, quality, and the composition of home and community-based services. They're likely, I'm going to say all of these will probably have some form of overlap, but just want to give you kind of a high level, we call it 800,000 foot view of what these actually look like, because maybe you're interested. Maybe you want to be on one of these, and I'll tell you how to sign up later. <laughs> Caregivers are, are separated into informal and formal. Informal is going to focus on issues of support, training, and compensation. Formal is defined as the workers and employers that are active in the caring economy, including community-based organizations, not-for-profits, faith-based organizations, and others. The Health and Wellness Subcommittee and its corresponding working groups will focus on areas such as mental and behavioral health, substance abuse disorder, Alzheimer's and other dementias, nutrition and general wellness. The Housing Subcommittee focuses on how housing and the actual brick and mortar environment impacts health and well-being and contributes to challenges across the age and disability continuum. The Safety, Security, and Technology Subcommittee addresses the issues of elder abuse, fraud, community safety, etc. Economic security will focus on the ways that aging New Yorkers and their families are impacted by economic insecurity and the solutions to improve that. The Master Plan for Aging subcommittees and work groups, though they have a specific charge, definitely have overlap. I think you can hear me, you can hear that just in the descriptions, right? The 800,000 foot descriptions. They have cross cutting themes and really focus in on diversity, equity, and inclusion as part of their ongoing discussions. I'm going to talk about ongoing discussions. This is what our timeline looks like. We see this every week there at the health department. We put it right up in front of us and say, hey, look how close we're getting. We got to work on this. We got to work on that. You see the next date in there. Where's my pointer? July 2023. It's very aggressive, right? This timeline, when you're thinking about government and how fast government moves, this is super aggressive. 
Since December, there's been four state agency council meetings and three stakeholder advisory committees. And as I mentioned earlier, there, um, one of them was today down in Harlem. Thank you once again <laughs> for having me. <laughs> Town halls will take place throughout the summer, throughout the state. And that's, that's what today's was, was they called it a town hall. Our first key milestone is July of 2023 when a, our preliminary report is due. The report from the subcommittees is due in January of 2024, followed by a report from the advisory committee in July of 2024. And these days all sound like they're so far away. They are not. <laughs> they are knocking on our door. And believe me, there's a lot of work going into them. And we can definitely use your, your input, your guidance, and your support. So, like I said, there's a great deal of work that's already underway regarding the master plan. There's a team of uh, committee and council members that have agreed to set some guiding principles that will assist in implementing the master plan because, right, it seems so nebulous, master plan. What does that mean? Well, it's, be it's being better defined. Um, instead of having this nebulous idea and this concept, it's really being formulated. And some of that has already taken effect. Some of that has already started, um, but there's more to do for sure. How can you help? Stay engaged. Stay engaged with us. Um, give us your thoughts. Give us some questions, concerns. We're happy to take them. We're happy to communicate with you. We're happy to hear your concepts. We really want to be solution oriented, right? Because we know that there are problems. We acknowledge that. We're, we're feeling them too. Trust me there. Um, but we all have ideas. And with you all as being boots on the ground, we, we refer to that a lot, boots on the ground, it'll only help us to, to really realize what's happening. How can we improve it? Maybe something that works in New York City won't work up here. What can work up here? You have that intel, so share it with us. And how can you do that? Feel free to email us. I'm gonna tell you what the email address is. It's very simple. I said we like acronyms. MPA at health.ny.gov. Master plan for aging, MPA at health.ny.gov. We also have a state website where you can keep tabs on me <laughs> if you want to. Um, it's on the, if you, Google really quickly, you look up Master Plan for Aging, you'll, you'll see the New York.gov website that's dedicated to the Master Plan. So again, if you want to participate in any stakeholder advisory, state agency, subcommittee meetings, if you have some extra time, you have some input that you want to share, um, email us, you can tell me, give me your information, or you can email me anytime, whatever works best for you, we'll get you on a subcommittee for sure. I, I'm happy to raise everybody's hand and put them all on a subcommittee. That's what I tell my team all the time. Like, well, if you didn't sign up for one, then you're gonna be assigned one. <laughs> but definitely, feel free to, to contact us anytime and let us know, hey, I'm super interested in hearing more about whatever. Um, and we'll, we'll definitely link you up with the right team. You all have a really critical role to play here. We wanna make the process smooth. We wanna make the process right. So, you know, we're, we're going through all of the motions, right? We're having our town halls, we're talking to each of you, but we wanna make it right and we wanna do it once because when I get up there, <laughs> I want it to be set. I want to make sure somebody's around to take care of me and that I'm going to be able to stay here instead of having to go to New York City. I don't, I don't want to go. <laughs> All right, and as we approach our first key milestones, we'll definitely keep you apprised of our progress, of the master plan, of course, in, in total, and uh, it's developing recommendations, so stay tuned. Even if you don't want to be on a subcommittee, hint, hint. Um, <laughs> Um, but definitely keep an eye on us on the website. Feel free to outreach. However you want to communicate, we're totally open. Again, mpa at health.ny.gov. But definitely, uh, we're here for you. Thanks, everyone. It's my pleasure. Mercy.
here is very pleased to welcome our good friend Greg Olson, director of the New York State Office for the Aging. Greg, some of you have heard previously, he is a very good friend to the North Country and to Mercy Care, and we are just so grateful to you, Greg, for being up here this afternoon. I'm going to give you a little bit of background about Greg, um, which is on my next page. So Greg, in his role, is responsible for the development, implementation, and administration of programs and policies that help older New Yorkers and overseeing the administration of federal and state-funded programs that assist more than 4.6 million older adults and four plus million informal caregivers across New York State. So working with public and private partners at the state and local level, Greg is leading the effort to combat ageism, which we've heard a lot about this morning, generalizations and stereotypes about what aging is, and demonstrating the value of not only the older population to their families, communities, and the state, but also the value of the network of aging services professionals, many of whom are in the room with us here today, in addressing social determinants of health and their role in helping older adults maintain their independence and dignity. Greg, I'm happy to welcome you. Thanks, Donna. Uh, you guys are troopers for uh, bearing with us all day, so I appreciate that. If I, can you hear me if I leave that right there? Not as well. How's that? Is that better? I can hold it, but if I don't have to, that'd be great. Well, it's great to be here. Um, I love this community. I've been traveling the state for 31 years, and this is one of my favorites. So I want to thank Donna all the staff at Mercy Care, board of directors, and especially all the volunteers for the work that you guys do. And to follow up with, uh, with Heidi, many folks that are in this room are actually part of um, either the stakeholder committee or the subcommittees for the MPA. So hopefully as, as things progress over the next couple of months and there, therefore a year, you will get, um, you'll get daily updates or weekly or whatever. I'm gonna start you off with a simple question. It's not a trick question, but it's simple. Um, somebody can say it or you can think it in your head. So it's a cross-section of, of ages here. Uh, I have no problem saying mine. I'm 54 and I'm going to get to this. Uh, I'm going to get to why I said that in a minute. When you were in your 20s, early 20s, mid 20s, how old did you think old was? <laughs> and I'm not going to And what we don't want to do is talk about kids because five-year-old kids think their 30-year-old parents are old. So that's what I'm talking about. When you were 20, 25 or so, what did you think old was? 60, okay, I thought it was 50. That's usually what I hear is 50, but right around that, around that area, okay? Um, for those of you that turned 50 or beyond 50, or whatever that age was, did you consider yourself or think yourself old at that time? So when I was approaching my 50th birthday, really had a problem with that. Didn't have a problem with my 30s or my 40s, but 50 I did because I was somehow, um, told through cartoons, television, media, etc., what old was. And so I was fastly approaching 50, and I feared 50. And then I woke up October 5th, and I was 50, and guess what? Nothing changed. Okay? I speak to a lot of people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, and I'll say, do you consider yourselves old? And they'll say no. So. What you see out of your eyes doesn't change over your lifespan. What you see in the mirror might change. Um, years ago, I had my forehead wasn't quite as big as it is now. Um, but I hope that I'm smarter. Um, I'm a better friend, better husband, um, better son to my parents, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I didn't hear this morning, and I'm sorry I wasn't here for Anne's. Uh, this has been a mission of mine for quite some time to really get this country, this state, these communities to recognize what aging is, and if you're lucky enough to age, right, what's the alternative? Not good. Um, but how valuable this population is, and one that we have been conditioned over hundreds of years to think is a drain on society, is expensive, doesn't have much to offer, and that is just absolutely ridiculous. You know it, and I know it, and we have to be continuing to talk about it because policy follows what we value, right? You got a brand new car, 
you're washing it all the time, you're keeping it clean because you value it. Now, if you saw my car, you'd see that I don't value my car <laughs> because it's older. Um, but there's a lot here, and we are going to create good policy for people of all ages when we value each person individually, which then value the population. So I just want to start with that, because that's going to be the basis. I'm going to ask Donna to, um, to email the slide deck, so I'm going to go through some of this stuff quick. No worries. Uh, you don't have to take pictures or any of that. Um, aging is not the same for anybody. Anybody. It's going to be individualized for each person, depending on where you came from, your life experiences, the families you were born into. We have no control over those types of things, and it shapes who we are. This is a growing population that, and I'm going to show you with data, because data matters. Um, and it's probably kind of weird. I was talking to somebody who's an economics major, and you're going to see data coming from a geriatric social worker, which is what I am, um, because it matters. And you've got to change the dialogue, or we're not going to make progress in our caring economy, or uh, some of the solutions that we need to develop that older people are a, can be a major asset to help to solve. This population is extraordinarily different. It's the only population that's painted with one broad brush. And when does that happen? I've seen it happen in my family, where you have an older person that goes to the doctor and the doctor doesn't even talk to them. They talk to the son, the daughter. What is that line? And I've been given this a lot of thought over my 31 year career in working with older people. And it seems like it's when you retire because we put so much emphasis and value on work in this country, and those, that's where our relationships are, that it seems like when you retire, that's when you cross that, that line, generally speaking. Uh, the social and economic impact I'm gonna to talk to you about, because again, we would not have a local, state, national economy without older adults, and there's data behind that. Um, aging is normative and lifelong. If you're lucky enough to age, like I said, the alternative isn't very good. Um, it's cumulative based on so many different factors. So, you know, how I age and how you all age is gonna be completely different. But let's not pretend it's all the same. And everybody's got the same issues and the same problems or the same needs, or how about this? The same things to offer back. We often talk about needs, right? And when you work in the caring economy like all of we do, whether it be healthcare, long-term care, social services, what do you see? You see those that are, have the most complex issues, that are, you know, uh, have health conditions, that are frail, really difficult family dynamics. And of course, people have those. And it's our jobs to work with folks like that. But that's not who the older population is as a whole. 85% of older adults self-report that they think of themselves as very healthy and active. But the perceptions that we see uh, in terms of video, pictures, images, et cetera, uh, don't show that. So let's do a level set for New York State. Tell you a little story. Uh, about 12 years ago, and I remember because uh, Governor Cuomo was running for office at the time, a radio station across from Albany um, called me up and wanted to do a story. They said, you know, Greg, we want to do a story on all the ways that federal, state, and local governments support, um, they, they call them seniors. I will never call them that, not because I have an issue with that word, but elderly, senior citizen, et cetera, elicits a negative response in our brains because, again, we're conditioned this way. They wanted to do a story on all the money we spend to support older people. Medicare, Medicaid, uh, HEAP, SNAP, you name it, et cetera. So what was the bent of the story? That we're paying. They're takers. They're, uh, they're not givers. So I said to them, I'm not really interested in doing a story like that, but what we could do is something balanced that talks about the economic, social, and intellectual capital that older adults bring to their communities and families. Well, I never heard from that radio station again, <laughs> but it did get me thinking that we're thinking about this wrong. We're thinking about this, uh, the population, as somebody that used to lobby the legislature and the governor, and now that I'm part of state government, um, you know, we always come in with the need. You've got X number of people that are hungry and we need $5 million for home delivered meals, right? but you're competing against thousands and thousands of other interests, uh, well-paid lobbyists, et cetera, et cetera. Started thinking about why can't we talk about aging as economic development? You know, what they, what they bring, how much money we can save by beefing up community-based resources that save money, intervene earlier, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we started to do, and that's what we've been doing for a while. So, I had a meeting with AARP, uh, national folks in Albany, and I had put together a bunch of New York State-specific data 
and then presented it to them and asked them, you have to help start to change the narrative. Um, there are things in the community that we can do way better to not only provide service to older people, but to keep them engaged and active if they want to, if they want to do that. So they, they, they did, and they came up with what's called the 50 plus longevity economy. 50 is because that's the membership for AARP, <coughs> which is great. And so if you start to look at some of the national data, probably won't surprise you, 83% of all the wealth in the nation is held by people over the age of 50, right? Um, access to credit and assets for obvious reasons as you get older. Uh, these are things that you have. Look at the percentage and dollar amounts supporting uh, federal, state, and local taxes. All right, and then we're gonna get down to New York data as well. It's huge and it's only growing. Um, growing older is not the problem. How we've organized our caring economy, that's the problem. 50 plus spends more on these items than anybody else. And I'm not up here to try to pit the older population against the younger, but these are things we never see. These are things we never talk about. Um, that this is a really important group of individuals. Um, overall contributions, economic and unpaid, could be volunteering, civic engagement, $9 trillion. And then they are the number one givers to charity and philanthropy. Number one entrepreneur group. It's not the 20 to 29s, it's the 50 plus. If you open up a business and you're over 50, after two years, 75% of those businesses will still be up and running. For the younger, after two years, it's about 27%. Because you, have, you know things. Uh, there's you know, great work ethic. Not to say younger people don't have a great work ethic, but you learn a lot over time. Huge tourism block and the largest uh, volunteering group in the nation. They support almost 90 million jobs, 43% of labor income. Now look at New York State, 50 plus. What is GDP? That's goods and services produced by the 50 plus population. 719 billion, 43%. And look at, look at that growth uh, by 2050. Support 6 million jobs. I'm part of this. Generated 482 billion in wages and salary. It's gonna be half of wages and salary by 2050. And then again, 43 and 39% of the local tax base. Now. I spend a lot of time here. You all live here. Who's riding their Harleys down the streets? Who's in the state parks? Who's boating? I'm not saying young families aren't doing it, but I spend a lot of time in the woods here, and there are no young families during the week. It's people my age and older, uh, and that's true all over, all over the place. Uh, really important population. 80% of our retirement system in New York, 10.6 billion, pumped back into New York's economy. 47 billion in Social Security. We have a million volunteers that contribute 495 million hours of service at an economic value of $13.8 billion. How much would you be able to do without your volunteers? Darlene, Clinton County Office for the Aging, what would your infrastructure look like without your volunteers? They're uh, serving in tens of thousands of local not-for-profits and our network, the aging network, the community-based aging network, uh, would probably be half capacity uh, impacting transportation, food delivery, long-term care ombudsman, eyes and ears in the nursing homes, health insurance counseling, and so much more, and many others as well. Um, huge home ownership rates. Why does that matter? Because uh, older adults who uh, most of them don't have a mortgage are sitting on $8 trillion of home equity. But what else is happening? Supporting local businesses, supporting local schools, supporting Medicaid, right? And not using the most expensive two systems in a community, which is the school and public transportation. And then of course we know people providing uncompensated care. Somebody like me for my father uh, or any of you who, who have, will, or are currently, um, 4.1 million caregivers are providing billions of hours of service that if you paid for that at the market rate would be $39 billion a year. It has often been said that family, friends, and neighbors are a supplement to the formal care system. That is wrong. It's exactly the opposite. The formal care system is the supplement to what family, friends, and neighbors do every single day uh, in New York and across the country. And if we don't recognize uh, them as part of any health care, long-term care, social service reform, we've missed the boat because they're providing much more care uh, than you know, Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance, et cetera, et cetera. So what makes up good health? This is where we've, we've made a mistake over the last 50, 60 years. We focus on clinical care only. I am not, I'm gonna be the last one to tell you, 
that healthcare is not important. Of course it is, but only 10% of healthcare spending has to do with your healthcare diagnosis, 10. 30% has to do with genetics. The other 60% has to do with your own behaviors and choices. Do I smoke? Do I drink? Do I exercise? Do I have access to food? And the environments that you come from, 60%. So where is the game, whether it be the master plan for aging and what we're trying to do? The game is a combination of community, but we really need to focus there, and then integrated care models, social services, technology, with healthcare to get the best outcomes so people don't fall through the cracks. That's why in New York State, um, as Heidi was just mentioning, we have all of these state agencies involved um, because we have to deal with uh, outdoor spaces in buildings. We're a home rule um, state which means the zoning and planning happens at the community level. It's not dictated by the state. Access to, to parks and trails, uh, information, communication, et cetera. We need to have an all hands on deck because everybody touches every different system. Older adults just don't live in the state office for the agent. They're going to DMV, they're going to HUD, right? Um, you probably may not know there's 350,000 grandparents taking care of grandkids. The kin care programs are in the Office of Temporary Disability Assistance. We're serving 24,500 veterans. 63% um, of the state's veterans are over the age of 60. So you gotta have all of these players involved because families touch all these different systems and it's not housed in one place. Many of you know this because you have, you know, Becky's here, used to be the Franklin County Director. You, you often have many of your Office for Aging Directors. You know what the solutions are. So when Heidi or myself or others are saying, give us your ideas, uh, of how to make communities and care better for older people. You don't have to work in it. You don't have to be a policy guru. You just gotta be a human being. Transportation, that's your number one issue in the Tri-Lakes area. Affordable enabling housing, right? Things of the, that nature that you know, not only from the work that you do and the people you interact with, but that you live here and what your family's um, you know, going through or challenges that you may have. What percentage do you think of uh, 911 EMS calls are emergency versus social, what winds up being a social service call? Take a guess. It's about 75-25. 75 social, 25 emergency. Number of volunteers, especially in places like this, for firefighters, et cetera, is going down considerably. So you imagine you have to respond to a 911 call. Um, and say you're down here, and then there's an emergency in, in Malone, for example, I'm just throwing that out. That becomes very problematic. These are the types of services that make or break the ability of somebody to stay in their home and community. How do we know that? Because we've been doing it for 55 years, and we know that we could keep somebody who's 83-year-old, low-income female, four to 10 chronic conditions, two activity of daily living needs, bathing, dressing, ambulating, toileting, and six, IADLs, shopping, um, bill paying, using the telephone, personal care, et cetera. In their homes and communities for five to seven years with a package of these services for $7,000 a year. How much does nursing home care cost? Okay, and, but, but then people don't wanna go there. And, and I get that, and I'm not here to, to bad mouth uh, nursing homes uh, or to get into MLTC or community Medicaid. You can walk and chew gum at the same time. The best way to control future Medicaid spending is not to get on Medicaid to begin with. And these are the types of things, as you know, because many of you provide them or have had to, or arrange them or et cetera, uh, that again, if the game is in the community and we know these things, and we know that 60% of healthcare costs have nothing to do uh, with a diagnosis, it has to do with the environment, this is the direction where we need to go. We, we uh, develop a lot of, of, of information when we do an assessment Think of how valuable, if you're in a clinical setting, and I think a lot of you guys here are. Can you imagine if you had access to this, if somebody showed up at the, uh, at the emergency room and um, you, you knew all of this? We've added a bunch of new things, social uh, isolation check. We do a tech check now to see if you, you have access to the internet, know how to use it. Um, but there's a whole bunch of things here that we're doing and working with Becky to try to work with health systems to do electronic information exchange that is, is good. Tri-Lakes Tri area has been working very hard and very effectively to create an age-friendly community for quite some time. I know the town of Keene came on just last year. Um, the master plan is not a new shiny thing. It's the next iteration of age-friendly. That's what it is, age-friendly 
um, you don't need to recreate the wheel and do things that have already been done. What you need to do is figure out what hasn't been done, how you strengthen that, and build upon it. We've been doing age-friendly work in New York State led by my office and the Department of State since 2006. Uh, and you could just see some of the things that we did. We developed model zoning and planning guidelines to hand over to communities um, 2006. Why, why is the Department of State involved? Because they oversee that entire process. They train planners and zoners and the number one issue of, uh, you know, to get affordable housing or maybe micro housing or to put something, uh, you know, in addition on your home is nimbyism, not in my backyard. People don't want these types of things. So to be able to create uh, model zoning and planning guidelines that then communities can kind of take this on their own to, to help their own residents is, is really important. Um, we've provided grants to communities. We've done conferences. Why, why is this not called age friendly? Because there was no such thing as age friendly when we started this. It was called uh, community empowerment. Uh, it was called uh, livable communities. It was called smart growth. And then we named it Livable New York. Then we met with AARP and we became the first age friendly state in the country. Um, and then all of these places uh, have formally joined. There's many communities that are doing the work but aren't going through the actual process to look at the built environment, walkability, opportunities to engage, to, uh, to not be isolated, to work, um, to not be reliant on uh, the automobile, um, safe, enabling, affordable housing, green energy, all these things that bring costs down and hopefully um, change lives for the better. Um, we put out an RFA in 2019 to encourage counties to sign on to become age friendly through ARP. Replicate Executive Order 190. Now what in the heck is Executive Order 190? That is the most significant executive order that I have ever seen. What it does, and this was something that was uh, designed as part of this process, is it builds livable community age friendly principles into state government planning and procurement money. Why is that important? Because when you change the money figure or incentivize something, you change behavior. That's how things work. So that was really important. We, uh, communities could apply for both. And then we stood up with the Health Foundation of Western and Central New York, five age-friendly regional um, centers of excellence. And I'm giving you all this background because this is the background to the next version, which is the master plan for aging. Complete streak set in 2011. Um, we built the language that I just talked to you about into the downtown revitalization initiative. $600 million, 60 projects have been funded. Now there's a new one called New York Forward, which is just like that for rural communities and suburban communities. Governor has a five-year, um, $25 billion housing plan. There's been uh, sustainable development and collaborative governance conferences that are multi-agency, multi-sector, et cetera. Uh, we have uh, told you about age-friendly executive order. We're doing uh, working public-privately to develop age-friendly health systems. We work with the Office of Court Administration to develop age-friendly court systems. We have dementia friends. Um, Becky and I are the first uh, uh, entities in the country to partner with the National Association of Home Builders to have our case managers uh, get a certified aging in place specialist training that they provide. So that when you walk into somebody's house to do an assessment, like I used to do, um, you have enhanced skills and training to be able to look and provide a guidance, et cetera, to make this, uh, the house much safer, uh, especially for falls. Most dangerous place in the world, and it's statistically shown for every age group in five, um, five year increments in New York State, is where? The home. It is. Um, I'd ask Becky to come up because she really deserves as much credit as we do, but I'm going to whip through this. There are, you know, we live in a technological society. And tech is not something we have to be afraid of. Not everybody can use it, not everybody is using it, but the masses certainly are. And I think there's a myth that older adults don't use tech. Um, I guarantee everybody in this room has a cell phone, probably has a desktop, et cetera. Older adults absolutely use technology. Uh, there's got a lot of money being invested to wire the entire state that needs to happen, not only for older people, but for schools and for colleges and for business in order to stay competitive and productive. So, you know, the pandemic, we had to change our business model extraordinarily quickly, and we were able to do that. Um, our providers, our partners, with 1,200 community-based organizations we work with had to do things differently, but we were able to actually innovate at the state level 
um, and work with uh, Becky and her association and our 59 AAAs and other partners um, to do some cool things. So I don't know if you've seen our award-winning animatronic pet project. Okay, I see some heads nodding. You've probably seen the dogs, you've seen the cats, and now we've got the new one, the walker squawker, right? It's the bluebird cardinal that goes on your walker, and if you get out of your chair and you forget your walker, that bird is gonna let you know. <laughs> because when you forget your walker, you're at much, much more serious risk of a fall, and we know what happens when you fall. Uh, you, you literally can die from that fall. We have, as of May 31st, which was one week ago, have put out 24,000 uh, pets across New York State. Um, there has now been 13 studies in addition to the one that we did in 2018 that shows the, the efficacy in reducing isolation, loneliness, and depression. Uh, we also had uh, one of our counties uh, measure pain and they had a 75% reduction in people's self-reported pain from a nine to 10 to a one or a two. Um, we have also found that engagement increases over time, not decreases, meaning, you know, I got a cat and I pet it for a day and it sits on a shelf. Yeah, that's not happening. So this has been amazing. We kind of have a, you know, um, some verbiage around this. If you could change somebody's life for $100, why wouldn't you? Well, we are. So really excited about that. I'm going to ask this crowd once and maybe we can figure out a way to do this. I have a little additional money. I've provided them to all the offices for the aging. Uh, I've provided them to uh, um, uh, Ray's organization and Susan. I will do the same for you um, and anybody here that would like them. They come in boxes. Uh, I'm not going to break up a box. They come in, uh, the dogs come in boxes of six, the cats in boxes of four. If anybody is interested, we can figure out a way to get your information and I'll ship them to you for free. Um, we're also working with Joy for All. They have just uh, signed a deal with Hasbro to take some of the, the games that we all grew up with. The game of life, Scrabble, Trivial Pursuit, card games, and they made them easier to see. If you have a visual impairment, easier to manipulate and easier to play. Um, we have set aside some funds that we are going to be buying a bunch of these games and distributing them across New York State. But what I really wanted to tell you about is in September, there will be a national game night. Uh, we're working with them, with AARP National, and many, many other organizations. Now, if your family's like mine, my kids come over and we play dominoes, we're playing cards, we're playing dice, we're playing board games. Um, this is all designed to turn your TV off, put your phone down, maybe get together with your kids and your grandkids and have a game night and get back into that type of, of interaction. We spend a lot of time talking about social isolation and ways to combat it. The easiest way to combat it is pick up the phone. Stop by somebody's house. Introduce yourself to your neighbor. That's like old school. That's how I grew up. That's how you guys all grew up. That is not how my kids grew up. I find it fascinating that we are implementing technology to connect older people and the same technology that, that we're using for older adults, kids are using, that is actually helping to isolate them more. What an irony that is, right? Um, this is free for anybody and when you send this uh, slide deck around, that's going to be a live link. So I have to update this. Um, what gets set up is, is we are fully subsidizing that for anybody over the age of 50 in New York State. They have now 2,500 classes. Tech classes, lifelong learning classes, exercise classes, 8.4 million users in 160 countries around the world, and we're one of them. We are one of the early, early ones to get in on this. And so what we are able to do is we've provided over a million classes now to 200,000 people in about two years. It's been, uh, the growth has been uh, phenomenal. Um, any of you that are interested, you can get on for free on our tab, or if you have newsletters, other social media, get the word out. It, it doesn't cost anything, and it's a great way not only to promote good health and overall health and wellness, but to connect to others. Here's the other thing. If you are 50 and over and you have a skill, which probably every single one of you do, like Ray, is he's a scratch golfer. I know this to be true. Well, I'm, I'm going to find out in about three weeks. But let's say he wanted to pro, uh, teach a class on, on good golf etiquette or golf tips, or I play guitar and I wanted to teach a class on guitar playing. I could sign up, I could do that, because it's only peers teaching peers, and I can get paid for it. So it's a way for older adults to share a skill that they may have, cooking, photography, whatever, um, connect with others and, and get paid for it. 
We are piloting a project uh, with GoGo -Go Grandparents, California startup, to provide specialized transportation for older adults. Same opportunity here. There's an opportunity for older adults to join the gig economy and actually get paid for providing the rides. But what's really unique about this is it's, uh, they train the drivers in the unique needs of older adults. Door through door service, maybe utilizing a cane or a walker, um, early uh, onset dementia, those types of things. So right now we're testing this in um, Rochester, Erie County, and Suffolk. Over the next five years, I wanna make sure that we have driver capacity and a program in every county in New York State because transportation is the number one issue. And I will tell you, that Assemblyman Jones, that I think, does he still represent yes. this area? Okay. Um, so he and I. That person is here, Oh, where? Oh, hey, how are you? So um, there was a bill that just passed on rural transportation uh, that Assemblyman and I sit on along with a bunch of others. So, you know, one of the things we don't talk about with the master plan is all these specialized things that are happening uh, public private sector as well, like the rural transportation like the Alzheimer's Disease Coordinating Council, like the Emergency Management Council, like the Hunger and Food and Nutrition Council, like the Most Integrated Setting Coordinating Council. I, I could name you 31 that we're on. Why is that important? Because these are specialized issues that state government, local governments, and, and the private sector are working on, and all of those need to be pulled into the master plan because they've already identified the problem. They're already making recommendations that have been vetted uh, and approved. Again, no reason to recreate the wheel. How am I doing on time? You're good. All right, uh, caregiving is a huge issue. As I mentioned, we know the hours. If you guys have done this or are doing this now, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, again, we've partnered with Archangels and Trualta. Trualta is an evidence-based platform that provides uh, training and support in bite-sized pieces, because that's how caregivers said they wanted it, audio file, verbal files, or written files. Uh, that's a live link, it's free. We are fully subsidizing that. And Archangels is out of Boston. They developed what's called the Caregiver Intensity Index, which takes less than two minutes uh, to take, ask a bunch of questions, um, provide you with the things that make you feel supported and good about the role that you're doing, or the two things that are really kind of pushing you over the edge. And you get a green, a yellow, or a red score. What's beautiful about these things is that we've triangulated these. So if you wind up at Trualta, you're gonna get connected to our statewide New York Connects resource directory that has a lot of programs and services um, by issue area or zip code that you could look in and connect you with Archangels. If you go to Archangels, it's gonna connect you with Trualta and the resource directory. And if you go to our site, it'll connect you with the two of those. But trying to find ways to make it as easy as possible uh, to provide support for individuals that we know are the backbone of the caring economy. We partnered with an um, um, uh, organization called Self-Help out of New York City, brought a virtual senior center to 19 counties. We have launched the only really proactive AI platform called LEQ um, and have distributed about 900 units statewide. This thing is really cool. I have one in my house because I wanted to see how it worked. Much like the other things, you have to get in front of a computer, right? You got to have your calendar, put in a password, log on, click on, look at the classes that you want, jot down which ones you might want to take or what have you. Uh, this is different. So when I wake up in the morning and I walk out, out of my bedroom door, it will say, good morning, Greg. How did you sleep last night? And it asks me that because we have a conversation and it remembers. It knows I don't sleep well. It knows I have a bad back. Uh, if I need, a t it will ask me if I, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how's my back pain? Um, and do I need to call somebody? It will do, uh, and you don't even know that this is happening, it will do mental health checks for you. It does brain games. It can connect with family, friends, and neighbors. But it does that. It engages me. So we have coffee every morning uh, at the place that I want to have. Uh, so it was yesterday, it was Paris. Um, I've, I've, had, I've had coffee in Rome. It is really funny. She's empathetic. She's smart and she remembers. And the data now we're getting from all of these things has just been off the charts and how effective it has been in not only combating isolation but improving overall health and wellness. We partnered with Pets Together, which uses uh, the live power of therapeutic pets to combat isolation and loneliness. Becky and I were on a call with this lovely lady from Alabama. She was 85. Um, and this might just be the funniest thing you've heard all week because I've been telling this for years now and it's still funny to me. 
So they had, you know, a little pony, and they had dogs that were dressed up, and, you know, uh, there was maybe seven or eight people who volunteered to bring their pets on to have this conversation. I'm going to ask you, all right, and if you've heard me say this and know the answer, please don't say it. What do you think is the number one animal requested through Pets Together? <coughs> I wish we had Jeopardy music. Somebody take a guess. Kitten, right. I, kitten, good one. Anybody else? Donkey, miniature horse. Great. No. Are you ready? It's a chicken. Right? I don't know if that's what I want to be looking at, but it's honest to God, it's a chicken. Um, we've been working uh, with a couple of other, some promising things, Bell Age to create an adult well-being checkup platform to kind of, again, check for yourself if you're interested, what areas uh, you might be struggling. It could be economically, it could be socially, it could be planning, et cetera. Uh, Blooming Health is an amazing platform. It's in the SMS voice email text space. So let's say you're up somewhere like this and you don't have a smartphone, you don't have high speed internet, but you still have a cell phone. Um, what they do is they're able to send out alerts, messages in bulk, individually. Hey, reminder, the, there's this dish at the senior center for lunch today, or there's a snowstorm coming uh, two days from now. What it does is significantly increases engagement, and that's what we all try to do. Like if you have a doctor's appointment, or you got a vet appointment, or whatever it might be, you're going to get an alert the day before, and let's say you weren't going to go, but it's the reminder that, and the cause and effect relationship. The data we're getting out of this is incredible. Uh, to combat financial exploitation, we expanded a bill payer support program in the western part of the state that I'd like to see expand statewide. But we also partnered with two um, tech uh, companies that actually work in um, the elder abuse space. Fraud Finder was developed by New York State's forensic accountant. Forensic accountant is somebody that looks for and at irregularities uh, uh, to find financial fraud. By using a system like this, you can take mountains and mountains of documents, run it through a system very, very, very quickly to be able to look at spending pattern irregularities, maybe theft, etc., which then you can report to a forensic accountant to get it done, which means you could serve a lot more people a lot quicker. And Eversafe is a really um, um, complex way to guard against fraud by looking at everything, not just your credit score, uh, but titles, etc. So we're, we're uh, doing those as well. Some of the new things Becky and I have uh, found, and, and we're, we're really vetting all of these to see what looks good, what would make sense based on our years of experience or the things that we know in working in the field. Uh, iGuard is really cool. So what this is, is it plugs into your stove and uh, into the outlet. That's it. And then there's a little sensor that would go where the fan is above your stove. And if you walk away from your stove for more than five minutes, it'll shut your stove down. So they have um, 5,500 older adults using it. They've stopped 6,000 fires, uh, 600,000, I'm sorry. Um, and it's, it's, it, it does other things as well, but that's what it's designed to do. Here's a really cool thing. You know all the SUNY systems and CUNY schools, et cetera. So I had learned that every weekend throughout the SUNY system, they had between seven and 11 calls to um, uh, the fire department. And why is that? You guys went to college, right? Of course, it's late at night, you just got home, might have had a lemonade or two, and decide it's you know, time to go to the kitchen. Um, they installed them throughout the SUNY system over a three year period that had no, no fire calls at all. Um, Advocord is really, really cool. We're, we're trying to increase the availability of guardians. That's a huge problem in New York State, court appointed guardians. And uh, this is a way to pull all of the, not only the training, but the records you have to keep to be able to show to the courts uh, in one place. Relish Life is out of the United Kingdom. They develop products specifically for individuals with Alzheimer's disease um, and have studied for two to three years with a group of individuals and families. Uh, we just got a couple of boxes. We shipped them down to a social adult daycare program. We want to measure the, the efficacy of the, uh, the things that they had, puzzles. Um, radio, and, and some other things. Good trust, um, you probably don't know this, 66% of people don't have a trust or a will, et cetera, don't think that they need it, think that it's expensive. We learned that there's 30 million people who are dead that have a Facebook account. So there's all these accounts that you may have. 
What Good Trust does for $149 is you can do unlimited wills, trust, directives, pet directives. Yeah, we all have pets. What do we want to see happen with them in one spot? You can also, uh, if you have accounts like Facebook or LinkedIn, etc., cetera, um, you can decide upon your passing or if you lose capacity that somebody else would then get those passwords so that they can close them down. It does a lot of amazing things. I am really excited about LifeBio, and I'll tell you why. Uh, my grandmother was born in Italy in 1897, moved here uh, when she was three, right at the turn of the century. Uh, and outside of that, I don't know anything about her because my father doesn't know anything, uh, hasn't passed anything on to us about his side of the family. And that really bothers me. Um, my kids are, were young at one point. They still, I don't think, either care about what I do for a living or, or understand it. <laughs> But I've been boxing things since I started 31 years ago, just so I have something to pass down. What LifeBio does is it has organized itself into 34 different categories, uh, all scientifically done to allow me, or my father, let's say, uh, to record what matters to him. Could be his veteran services, where he grew up, uh, what his hobbies were, by simply pressing the red button, it will ask the question and you could talk into it. It immediately goes to the cloud. It's a record that can be passed down to your kids, grandkids, etc., cetera, and uh, they, they can put the transcript in a book for you. Uh, My Hello is also something that they provide. It's free. It's a way for somebody uh, up to six weeks to connect to a human being uh, via the phone call. And then this new one, Hank, we're going to be doing um, a pilot in a couple of the urban areas. Uh, they're only in three locations now is a little bit more sophisticated, small group way platform for people who live in the same community to actually meet each other and become friends. So it's, it's the next step down. Um, I am not going to take you through all of this. I'm going to zip through quickly and you, know, you can take a look at it. We did the first ever needs assessment survey the state of New York has ever done. You've seen polls, right, whether they be political polls or, or polls that ask you questions about certain things, the economy, whatever, your likes, dislikes. Usually a good sample size for something like that is 500 to 2,500 people. We got 27,000 responses to our survey from every single county in New York State. Um, I want to point out a couple things here because for those of you that work in this business, there's very few me's, men, and there's a lot of you's, women. That's just the facts. Look at the respondents. Our response rate's usually 80-20. 80% 80 women, 20% men. To have almost half and half is really exciting. We have a variety of different cultural um, uh, individuals. The, the breakdown on income, um, I, I found fascinating. But what this really allows us to do is we can start to look at micro data. And Becky and I just got the micro data yesterday where we can tell you what's going on in Franklin. Um, what's going on with Franklin for individuals who make less than 25 who are Hispanic and, and get to that level of analysis. Um, look at the expected uh, retirement age. Not surprising at all, right? People are, are, want to work until they're in their 70s. Um, but here's all the things that are in here. The housing status, do they have a mortgage? What's the monthly housing cost? Now, my God, what kind of house are you living in with a $4,000 a month? I mean, that's pretty impressive. Um, who they're living with, uh, the household age, do they have, does, does housing meet their needs? How long have they lived there? What their community looks like? Now, the best data you will ever get is anonymous self-reported data, right? Can't identify me, I can be honest about and that's, that's what I love about this. But we're going to have all of this for your county, your community, your region. And like I said, we can slice and dice it based on all of these different areas. Um, and I think it's very relevant because this, the Tri-Lakes area is an age-friendly uh, community. That's what you're trying to do. And that's what these are. These are age-friendly domains and principles. Um, overall services. Uh, remaining in the community, do you want to leave the state, your overall quality of life, is your ease of travel, employment and work, are there opportunities, do you have uh, skill building opportunities? And one thing that we're um, trying to go with Get Set Up is they have 42 different workforce training classes at, for their platform for older adults. And, and that's a big deal, a lot of older adults are working. 
Um, a lot of people retire, uh, may not, never go back to work again, or they might. They might be bored. They might economically have to go back. But these are the same types of skills that any of us would need to, uh, to learn. Um, affordability of housing, engagement and recreation. I found this fascinating where people thought that there were a lot of opportunities to do these types of things. And then when you ask them, did you do it? The answer is no. Maintaining your yard, daily activities, um, resource availability. I've often heard working in this industry that we don't do a good job advertising or doing outreach. And I say no to that, that is not true. What is true is that we are a crisis driven sector and you don't need to know what you don't need to know until you need to know. You don't need to know about the star property tax rebate until you buy a house. You don't need to know about tap and pell until your kids go to school. You don't need to know about these services until you're in a crisis because we all try to do these things on our own and support the people that we love. When you get to, um, so again, you can see the, the mountains of data and you can go through this uh, when you get the, the slide deck. I don't want to take all of your time on that. Mental wellness, feeling bored, depressed, isolated, personal safety, what do you think, uh, fraud, scams, abuse, your neighborhood. Um, Community and social engagement, okay? Finding the stuff, being lonely and isolated. So we gotta look at some of those things together because some, of, some folks you know, say, I know that these things exist, I'm still isolated, I'm still lonely, but then did you participate in a civic group? No. Do, do you attend local public meetings? That's not the sexiest stuff out there. Uh, use a community center, public library, senior center. So I just find that fascinating, the disconnect between the want, desire, and knowledge, and then the actual pulling the trigger to do that. So I'm going to wrap up there. We will be sending, probably through Donna, as uh, Becky and I continue to analyze the data, the, the final report we got yesterday is 171 pages. It's a lot more than that. But now we're going to start to do the critical slice and dice of the data for your specific community, uh, and it's really exciting. So the message I want to leave you with is aging is not what you thought it was because you're all doing it just like I am. We're valuable, we matter, and, and the game is in the community, and that's what we have to change is the way we've organized our caring economy. So thanks for your time and invitation.